Welcome back to AP Chemistry as we continue Unit 2, Section 7. In this video, we are focusing on the valence shell electron pair repulsion theory, sometimes called the Vesper theory. And we're going to use this to help us understand the molecular geometries and bond angles and shapes, basically, that these molecules tend to take. Now, when we say valence shell electron pair repulsion theory, that means exactly what it says. What that means is the only electrons that are participating in the bonding and the structures of these molecules are the valence shell electrons. We don't worry about the core electrons here. And they are always going to be paired up. Notice that whenever we draw these structures, these Lewis diagrams, we always draw the electrons in pairs because that's how they're structured in the molecule. They're paired up. And they're going to repel each other. What that means is that in molecules, both the bonding and the non-bonding pairs of electrons are going to repel each other. That means that they're going to try to get as far away from each other as they possibly can. And as we uh, draw the structures and try to visualize these geometries and actual shapes of these molecules, we're going to see that that idea of electron repulsion governs the shapes that these molecules take. Take So let's take a look at several examples. Here's the first one. This is kind of a basic example. If you have a molecule that has a central atom and four sigma bonds that are emanating from that, well, notice that this is called a tetrahedral structure. Now, this is shaped quite a bit differently than you than you might have expected it uh, to be shaped based upon the way we draw it on paper. When you draw this on paper, you might expect to have a 90 degree bond angle because you have one in the middle and then you always draw them you know, in the, those nice right angles. But in the real world, molecules are in three dimensions. And this is not a 90 degree angle. In fact, it's significantly more than that. This is a 109.5 degree bond angle. And you need to know that. You need to know that a tetrahedral bond angle, that is four sigma bonds, a central atom bonded to four other atoms and no, uh, no other unshared pairs there, will be 109.5 degrees tetrahedral. You have to know that. I hate to use the M word, but yeah, you have to memorize that. You, you do need to know that bond angle as well as, the, as well as these other bond angles as well. Let's take a look at a case where we have three sigma bonds and one unshared pair. Now in these pictures, I'm going to use one of these little purple uh, kind of slender sticks here to represent the unshared pair. In real life, uh, unshared pairs, of course, are electrons. And electrons are very, very tiny. In fact, they would, for all practical purposes, be invisible. You would not be able to see that. So let's imagine that that electron pair is there, but you just can't see it. And what you would see is a geometry called trigonal pyramidal, because you'd have a base down here that has this triangle as a base. So that's why it's trigonal. And it's, it's raised. It has this pyramidal shape to it. And its bond angle is going to be 107 degrees. So anytime you have a molecule that has the central atom and three bond angles and the one unshared pair, trigonal pyramidal, 107. Now maybe you're wondering, why is this a smaller bond angle? It fundamentally looks the same as, as, as tetrahedral, isn't it? And you might even look at this and say, it actually does have a, a tetrahedral uh, electron geometry, right? Its electrons are that way, but that's not what the molecule looks like. In the molecule, the bond angle is smaller because unshared electron pairs exert more repulsion than shared pairs. So this unshared pair here is able to push those other uh, bonds a little bit closer to each other, not much, just a couple of a degrees worth, but enough to make that bond angle just a tad smaller. So that's why this bond angle in trigonal pyramidal is about 107 degrees. Now, if we were to amputate yet another sigma bond off here and turn this into an unshared pair, we'd have a molecule with two sigma bonds and two unshared pairs. 
and it would look something like this. And, and once again, remember that unshared pairs, these lone pairs, are practically invisible. So you would not be able to see these little purple unshared pairs that I have uh, drawn here. So what would you have? Well, you'd have what would essentially be a bent structure. So you'd see this central atom, and you'd see those two other atoms, but you wouldn't see the unshared pair. So it is a bent structure. And what is the bond angle going to be like here? Well, we know that we have two unshared pairs. So guess what? The repulsion is going to be a little bit more than it was in the last one. So it's going to be down to about you know, 104.5, about 105 degrees, if you want to round that off to the nearest whole number. So about 105 degrees on a bent molecular geometry. If you look at the molecules that we've been drawing, water is a really good example of this. Water has the two sigma bonds, but it also has two unshared pairs on that central atom. So uh, we see that water has a bent structure. It's not linear, as some people might think, by, by looking at it. Now let's try another structure. Let's try a structure that has just three sigma bonds, doesn't have any uh, unshared pairs on it any lone pairs on there. So this is what we have. Now notice that that is essentially a flat structure. It's a flat molecule. So in science we call that planar. If something is flat, it's planar. And notice that it essentially has this triangle structure to it. This is called trigonal planar. And that's exactly what it means. It's a flat triangle. And the bond angle, you can probably figure this out using mathematics. A circle is 360 and we've divided this into three equal sectors and so that means each bond angle is going to be 120 degrees. So anytime you see a molecule with three sigma bonds and if you look back into uh, the notes that we've been looking at in our previous lessons here especially in uh, unit 2 section 6 and section 5 where we're drawing these structures you can probably uh, point out a few molecules that have this trigonal planar structure, 120 degree bond angle. Now, what happens if we amputate one of these bonds and replace it with an unshared pair to make it look like this? Well, it's still, for all practical purposes, planar, still flat, but notice that this unshared pair is invisible now and it has a repulsion, doesn't it? So it's going to push those other two bonds a little bit closer to each other. And so now we have a structure that we call angular. Now, what's the bond angle here? Well, it's not 120. It's a little bit less than 120. It's about 117 degrees. So when you have a structure like this, two sigma bonds with the one unshared pair, that has an angular geometry. 117 degrees. Now let's try another structure. Let's say we have something like this, where we have just two sigma bonds. There are no unshared pairs. You can probably figure out the bond angle just by looking at it, can't you? That's 180 degrees, and that's called linear. And that's a good name for it because it's basically looking like a straight line. So it is linear 180 degrees. So those uh, shapes are pretty easy to, to pinpoint as you're looking through the examples that we've done previously in this unit. So these six shapes, these are the ones that follow the octet rule. These are uh, by far the most common that you're going to encounter in AP chemistry and to be honest in most of chemistry. However, you are responsible for knowing some of the other structures, the ones that are exceptions to the octet rule, more specifically the expanded octets. And these have some, sometimes a little bit more complicated and somewhat unusual shapes. Let's try a couple of those. Let's try a case where you'd have five sigma bonds. And so here I've uh, made the molecular model for that. We have a central atom, five sigma bonds. And as you look at that, you might notice it actually seems to have two different bond angles. There is a trigonal part to this, is like a triangle part of this, it's kind of lying on its side here, and there's also uh, a pyramidal part of this, it's kind of a right angle here, as you see at this part here. So we actually call this trigonal bipyramidal, because it does have that triangular facet to it, 
but it also has a pyramid. In fact, it's two pyramids, one up here, and then I flip it over, there's one down here. So the bond angles are 90 degrees and 120 degrees. So two bond angles on this one. So a little bit more to learn. Now what about if we go a little bit higher and say something with six sigma bonds, something that looks like this. We did have a couple of these in our uh, practice, I believe. Something with a six sigma bonds, well, if you look at the structure here, this is called octahedral. And maybe you're wondering, why is it called octahedral if it has six sigma bonds? Well, if you connect the dots on here, you end up with a solid that has eight faces, four faces on top, flip it over, you have four faces on the bottom. So we have eight faces. Kind of looks like a diamond if you were to connect the dots on this. And look at the bond angles. Every single bond angle is perpendicular. It has that 90 degree bond angle. Kind of looks like one of those little jacks that you can spin that kids, have, that kids used to play with, you know. Another one, in fact, this will be our last one, I believe, that I wanted to model for you. One that has four sigma bonds and two unshared pairs. And notice the way that I have these configured here. I have uh, the two unshared pairs, which are going to be, for all practical purposes, invisible, and they are configured as far away from each other as possible. Right? That's what the Vesper theory tells us, that these unshared pairs will be as far away from each other as possible. They want to repel. And we have these other sigma bonds here. Notice that you're not going to see these unshared pairs. So, so if you were to look at that and just kind of pretend that those unshared pairs aren't there because they're invisible, you're going to have a planar or a flat structure. And it looks like a square. So square planar is a good name for this. And the bond angle, everything has a perfect perpendicular 90 degree bond angle. So those are the nine most common molecular geometries and bond angles. Now, to summarize, these are pretty much everything that you see here, the ones that we had in the uh, examples, plus there are a few more. And as you go through here, you might see that there are some that might be a little bit different that we didn't have on uh, the examples, like square pyramidal and T-shaped and seesaw. And there's another trigonal planar. Uh, it's good to know those. Uh, you are expected to know, and I once again hate to use the M word, but to memorize these molecular geometries and bond angles for the AP exam or general chemistry in college. You are expected to know these. So those are the molecular geometries. Now, how does this affect the way that molecules actually behave in the laboratory and in the real world? Well, there's something called the polarity of a molecule that's very important. And as you've looked at these molecules, there's a good chance that you've noticed that some of these molecules have somewhat of a lopsidedness to them or maybe an unbalanced region of negative charge. These are called polar molecules. Now in this example that I have with water here, you might notice that there's a lopsidedness to it. And we see that because right up here on top, we have all these lone pairs. We have these two lone pairs of electrons just kind of hanging out by themselves, and they're unbalanced. There's this unbalanced region of negative charge. And that's why water is a good example of a polar molecule. Now, what does that mean? Well, it can be attracted by an electric field. If you take a balloon, just as an example, and rub that on your hair, just rub the balloon on your hair for a while, course it's going to make your hair stand up. Now take your take that balloon and place that very close to a narrow stream of water. You can try this at home and you'll notice that there's a deflection. That balloon is going to uh, attract that uh, stream of water. It because and that happens because water is a polar molecule. It's attracted to an electric field. Now how about this? Is there any unbalanced region of electrons here? Negative charge that's, that's this lopsided, unbalanced? No, everything is perfectly balanced out. There are no unshared pairs of electrons here at all. This is a nonpolar molecule. 
That means if you could get a little stream of liquid methane, for example, and you know get that balloon, rub that on your hair, it would not attract nonpolar. How about this molecule? This is one that we've seen quite a bit in this unit already. Is there any unbalanced region of negative charge? Yeah. In addition to the fact that there's a triple bond and this is only single, there is this unshared pair right over there on the nitrogen. So this is a polar molecule. Now, there are some textbooks and some chemistry teachers that talk about polarity as being, or, or nonpolar molecules as being symmetrical. I don't use the word symmetry because it is incorrect. It is not correct to say symmetry. Because you can look at this polar molecule and say it's symmetrical. You can draw a line of symmetry down here. Symmetry has nothing to do with this, folks. It's not symmetry at all. It is lopsidedness. It is unbalanced region of negative charge. That's what makes a molecule polar, not lack of symmetry. That's not what it's about. So look for unbalanced electrons. Look for lopsidedness. Look for any region where there are electrons that aren't balanced out. So let's take a look at a few examples and let's determine if these are polar or nonpolar. What about the nitrogen trifluoride? Well, you might notice that we have an unshared pair, a lone pair of electrons on the nitrogen. And it's not balanced out by anything else. So that is a polar molecule. Just a little hint, Anytime you see exactly one lone pair, one unshared pair of electrons on a central atom, it's pretty much going to have to be a polar molecule. Okay, so you can just kind of just, just remember that one unshared pair on the central atom means it has to be polar. And that kind of gives it away on this, doesn't it? There's one unshared pair on that sulfur that's not balanced out by anything else. So th yeah, this is a polar molecule. It has that lopsidedness to it. How about carbon dioxide? Is there any lopsidedness to this? Any unbalanced region of charge? No, it's all balanced out. We have some unshared pairs over here, but they're perfectly balanced out by the unshared pairs over there. So that is a nonpolar structure. How about phosphorus pentachloride? It's all balanced, isn't it? Every, there are a bunch of unshared pairs, but they're all perfectly arranged around there. Nothing is lopsided here. So this is a nonpolar molecule as well. Our last example, how about ammonia, NH3? Any lopsidedness here? Any unbalanced region of charge? Most definitely. There's exactly one unshared pair of electrons on the nitrogen. It's not balanced out by anything else. So this is a polar molecule. I hope you've learned something about polarity of molecules and how to determine bond angles and molecular geometry, Vesper theory. There's a lot going on here, so keep practicing. And this wraps up Unit 2. Hope you've enjoyed this. Hope you've learned a lot about chemistry here. Go ahead and give me a thumbs up if you learned something. I'm looking forward to seeing you as we jump into Unit 3 very soon.